This webinar will examine how the fossil fuel and chemical industries have created climate emergencies that have threatened global food production, human health, and soil health. We will explore the ubiquitous presence of chemicals on our food supply and the significant cumulative impacts of extreme heat, pesticides, herbicides, GMOs, and the current COVID-19 pandemic on agricultural communities, as well as the promise of regenerative agriculture. Now I'd like to introduce you to our moderator for this evening's webinar, Dr. Ted Shetler. Dr. Shetler is the science director of the Science and Environmental Health Network. Dr. Shetler has practiced medicine for many years while also focusing on working with community groups and non-governmental organizations in the US and internationally to address human health and the environment. He has served on advisory committees of the US EPA and the National Academy of Sciences and serves as science director for the Collaborative on Health and the Environment and actively participates in the Healthcare Without Harm Coalition. Dr. Shetler. Anne-Marie, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And I should apologize uh, to all the participants for my not being able to turn on my video camera, but there seems to be uh, a glitch in the technology this evening. Nonetheless, I'm delighted to be here uh, and to moderate this uh, panel discussion. Uh, before we start with the uh, panelists, uh, I wanna just make a few introductory remarks about the food system with an eye on the environmental justice implications. To begin with, we ought to probably describe what we mean by a food system. It really encompasses an entire value chain, beginning with food production, which of course requires inputs such as seeds and fertilizers, chemicals, animals, fuel, land, and other infrastructure, and labor, of course. And then there's transportation off the farm, there's food processing, both meat and plant-based foods, packaging, distribution, consumption, waste, and recycling. Uh, and we can see that there are environmental justice and equity considerations throughout every step of this value chain. In the United States, the dominant food system is highly industrialized. It's driven in part by food and farm policies that have been in place over many years, including, for example, federally subsidized crop insurance for some crops and not for others, and various financial incentives that have been put in place. The result is that we have a system that's producing abundant calories. Much of it is inexpensive and much of it is of poor nutritional quality. Like factories, this industrial model emphasizes inputs and outputs, efficiencies and productivity, while often seeking to externalize adverse impacts when possible. Things like health impacts on farm workers, their families and farming communities, widespread environmental degradation. This dominant model features large monocrops. For example, there are tens of millions of acres of corn and soy planted in the Midwest. There are large confined animal feeding operations through much of the agricultural country otherwise known as CAFOs, that raise for slaughter nearly 10 billion pigs, chickens, and cows each year. These animals produce large amounts of manure, most of which is spread on nearby land. So there are adverse public and environmental health impacts of, of this food system, many of which are not included in the cost of the food, but the costs are borne by others, and we'll hear about that this evening. There are effects of exposures to chemicals such as pesticides and other environmental toxicants. Uh, farm workers and their families are often much more highly exposed than others in the general population. There's antibiotic resistance from excessive non-targeted overuse of antibiotics in animal agriculture. Adverse health effects are associated with energy consumption and transportation. For example, the health effects that we all know about are associated with air pollution from fossil fuel combustion. And I want to point out specifically that the energy intensive production of nitrogen fertilizer is often overlooked and not included in the agricultural budget. There are greenhouse gas emissions that are uh, associated with agriculture to the extent that agriculture accounts for about 25% of all global greenhouse gas emissions 
animal agriculture alone accounts for about 15% of global greenhouse gases. There's agriculture related water contamination with pesticides, for example, and nitrates in surface and groundwater from fertilizer runoff and excessive manure applications. And farming communities most are often most affected. The nitri nitrates in private wells and in some municipal water systems is often at unsafe levels with a disproportionate in economic and health impacts felt in poorer farm families. There's air pollution from food production practices, for example, pesticide drift and manure related emissions, which result in intolerable odors in uh, farming families with asthma as a direct health impact from these emissions. There are homes near hog CAFOs where uh, the spreading of manure on the land during windy conditions results in actually in the homes being sprayed with uh, liquid manure. So farm workers, food processors, and agricultural communities often endure disproportionate risks and impacts, as we'll hear from our panelists uh, this, this evening. I want to just finish here by mentioning uh, a new book that's been published by journalist and author Mark Bittman. His new book is called Animal Vegetable Junk, A History of Food from Sustainable to Suicidal. It's described in a recent review as a comprehensive treatise on humanity's relationship to food. He makes no bones about the challenges that we face. He says in his book, you can't talk about agriculture without talking about the environment. You can't talk about animal welfare without talking about the welfare of food workers. And you can't talk about food workers without talking about income inequality, racism, and immigration. Every issue touches, uh, touches another. That seems to me to sum it up uh, very well. So with that, I want to move to our first panel uh, presenter. Dr. Yogi Hale Henlon has worked with UCSF for over 15 years, first as a pre-doc uh, pre uh, fellow under Stan Glantz, and then as a postdoc under the current director of the Center for Tobacco Control Research and Education, focusing on how industries influence chronic diseases. Since then, he has worked with UCSF's Environmental Health Initiative, researching chemical and fossil fuels industry documents in the industry documents library to figure out what various industries knew and when, and what health harms they discovered but never publicly disclosed. Yogi is also an assistant professor of the Dynamics of Inclusive Prosperity Initiative at Erasmus University Rotterdam in the Netherlands and as a principal investigator on the research project Agribusiness and its Alternatives. So with that, please go ahead, Yogi. Thank you so much, uh, Ted, um, and it's a pleasure to be here with you all. So the title of my presentation uh, today is uh, Moving Beyond Glyphosate. Uh, and we'll see that glyphosate is um, one of, or first I must say that I have no financial conflicts of interest to declare. Um, and we'll talk today about food production and health, glyphosate, what it is, um, why we should talk about the most used pesticide in human history, and the um, paradox that workers are actually the most harms, but it was in some ways consumer uh, health concerns that put glyphosate on the policy map. Uh, then we'll talk about glyphosate litigation by janitors, gardeners, and groundskeepers and where that has taken us and how this is based on UCSF's own uh, in industry documents that came out of this litigation um, and related suits. And you can look at uh, uh, industrydocuments.ucsf.edu and find a treasure trove of previously secret uh, industry documents from tobacco, food, pharmaceutical, chemicals, uh, and uh, the fossil fuel industry as well. And I'll talk about the problem of regulatory whack-a-mole, uh, pesticide drift, and finally end about how we need to uh, look at paying the true cost of food. Um, and that's how we can sort of turn things around for our health and for the planet. So Rachel Carson in 1962 wrote in Silent Spring, it is ironic to think that man might determine his own future by something so seemingly trivial as the choice of an insect spray. 
right, or an herbicide. More recently, Michael Pollan at UC Berkeley has written, you are what you eat eats. And many people took this to have to do with, you know, the uh, grass-fed beef movement, um, looking at, you know, cage-free uh, eggs and that such thing. But most people aren't as aware of the fact that fertilizer diets versus a rich uh, natural soil uh, diet full of life um, has very different uh, determinants of the quality of the micronutrients um, and the beneficial uh, microbial metabolites in the food that we eat. So for example, fertilizers uh, can deliver lots of macronutrients to the plants, but as they absorb these macronutrients um, more than you could say uh, um, non-agribusiness, um, non-chemical uh, uh, fertilized uh, agriculture, we actually see a diminishment of micronutrients and beneficial microbial metabolites. So plants can get addicted to, to fertilizer and uh, work with pesticides like junk food uh, in the same way that we can. Uh, we know that um, uh, phosphorus, uh, nitrogen, um, and uh, uh, potassium have all been uh, fueled uh, for um, the green industrial revolution. Um, and it has produced more food, but the quality of that food has um, not been what it was previously. For example, um, there's strong evidence for a five to 40% decline in the mineral content of fruits and vegetables uh, in the previous 50 to 70 years. And we know that uh, plants um, which are bred to be able to soak up these pesticides and not die while all the other vegetation around them dies, um, that that gets transferred onto us and that the residual pesticide, which uh, is on the soil, uh, gets swept into the air. It can drift uh, uh, as far as kilometers, uh, impacting the health of people who live around these farms. Um, and while these are toxic foods, you know, that are uh, toxic uh, if ingested, they're much more toxic for those uh, who are actually exposed to the spraying and those communities uh, surrounding the sprayed field, uh, fields, especially uh, children living next to these fields. So um, you can he see here, uh, just from the Council on Environmental Health, uh, a small selection of the most common uh, uh, pesticides that are used. Pesticide is sort of an umbrella category for herbicides and insecticides and uh, fungus, fungicides and other um, uh, uh, sort of fumigants. And um, in a policy statement on uh, pesticide exposure to children in the journal P Pediatrics, uh, the Council on Environmental Health wrote, uh, for many children, diet may be the most influential source of pesticide exposure. Um, and uh, there was a study that they cite uh, where children were put on an intervention of a uh, purely organic uh, diet pro uh, of uh, um, food produced without pesticides and they observed drastic and immediate decreases in urinary excretion of pesticide metabolites. Um, so um, there is uh, empirical evidence uh, for this. And they also suggest that integrated pest management um, may be the way to go. They say it's an established but under-supported approach to pest control design to minimize and in some cases replace the use of pesticide chemicals while achieving um, acceptable control of pest populations. This is a slide uh, from our colleague at UCSF, um, uh, Rupa uh, Maria, um, who discusses the uh, relationship between human health, soil health, and uh, plant uh, and environmental health. And that when we use synthetic pesticides, um, we're introducing into our environment um, both uh, uh, harms to plants and environment, um, so to the environment of, uh, of plants, and also into our environment, uh, including carcinogens, endocrine disruptors, uh, nervous system uh, disruptors, um, and uh, reproductive harm being some of the major ones. So what is glyphosate? 
it is the active ingredient in the Monsanto now Bayer uh, weed killer products Roundup and Rager, as well as over 700 other commercial herbicides. 50% uh, of um, Monsanto's profits uh, a few years ago before it got um, bought by Bayer uh, came from glyphosate uh, based products and the sort of uh, ecosystem of uh, agricultural products um, that their business sold. So they had literally bet the farm uh, on glyphosate. Um, an interesting fact is that um, in the 70s, uh, in order to sell more glyphosate, the very first genetically modified organisms were not, you know, this golden rice to increase, uh, you know, vitamin A, uh, but they were actually plants designed to withstand uh, glyphosate so that you could spray it and it would kill everything except these plants that could just so keep on soaking it up without dying. So the very first uh, genetic modification was in order to um, sell more glyphosate in essence. And over uh, 826 million kilograms have been applied uh, in uh, 2014 alone, which was a hundred times more than um, uh, uh, 1974 levels. And worldwide, um, there's been enough glyphosate sprayed uh, so that you, nearly half a pound of Roundup would be on every single cultivated acre of land in the world. So that's how ubiqu ubiquitous it is. And golf courses, you know, which are places that um, are, you know, manicured uh, to meet you could say unreasonable standards, um, have some of the most pesticides of any um, uh, place on earth, uh, more than flower fields even. And um, what we see is that um, the, the chemicals, including glyphosate that are used and sprayed on golf courses oftentimes drift uh, you know, several kilometers away. Um, and that the workers, the appliers, uh, the groundskeepers um, are those who are most um, vulnerable to this. But also uh, there's a reason why you're not supposed to pick up your ball from the green without a glove on. You're not supposed to you know, uh, be romantic uh, and take off your shoes and walk barefoot in the grass. Um, you could burn your feet. Um, and so uh, there's been a, a lot of uh, work around this. There's a movie called Ground War uh, that uh, talked about um, how people who spend a lot of time on the golf course uh, tend to get uh, certain uh, cancers, even if they're very health conscious, and um, that most people go golfing because they want to be health conscious and the uh, sort of, uh, you could say, uh, unintended consequences of that. And what we see from the industry documents here at UCSF is that um, Monsanto uh, has always uh, striven to be a representative of regulators, farmers, and society. So shortly after um, uh, the uh, uh, IARC, uh, the, um, the International Agency um, on uh, Cancer Research, um, came out saying that glyphosate was a, a probable carcinogen they, Monsanto mounted a large uh, sort of uh, counter movement and uh, they had a panel organized uh, with members of the EPA. And they said, ultimately, this, this panel ultimately is not about arguing the science and evidence, but about the consequences of signaling cancer-based risk upon peak precaution and potential hazard rather than a robust risk assessment as it is uh, conducted by um, risk uh, regulatory authorities. So, they proposed to include someone from Monsanto um, to explain the ramifications of the IR classification for regulators, farmers, and society. So they're taking on the mantle of defending uh, regulators, farmers, and society from um, this uh, uh, finding of the most renowned uh, uh, cancer uh, board on earth uh, of glyphosate's toxicity, even though they knew in 1985 already uh, that uh, glyphosate uh, was carcinogenic and they uh, suspected it to be, but uh, they got their scientist um, to present an evaluation to the EPA, which almost banned uh, glyphosate um, in uh, 1985, but they, 
if you read down here, it says, in an effort to persuade the agency that the observed tumors found in these, uh, these mice um, are not related to glyphosate. So this repeats what we see being inside and outside um, science. And so we see lots of proxy lobbying um, from uh, Monsanto and the agrochemical uh, uh, agencies in review processes. Um, here is uh, Jesse Rowland, an EPA uh, uh, confidant of uh, Monsanto, saying, if I can get um, uh, this uh, review, the ATSDR review, uh, killed, I should get a medal. Um, and we're also seeing that uh, uh, Monsanto is working with the EPA in order to uh, create a response to minimize and downplay um, this finding by IARC about um, the toxicity and carcinogenicity of uh, glyphosate. But um, things are looking up. Um, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry um, in 2019 released this uh, report uh, that shows that uh, numerous studies reported risk ratios uh, greater than one for association between glyphosate exposure and the risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or multiple myeloma. And we're also seeing that in uh, meta-analyses that the evidence is just clear, no matter what uh, industry uh, sort of representatives or spokespeople want to say, um, we're very clear um, that there is uh, indeed a link between uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and glyphosate exposure. So you, many of you might know right here in San Francisco that we made history um, with uh, this uh, case against um, Monsanto, uh, now Bayer, um, with large verdicts, and that um, this ended in a uh, $10.9 billion settlement in 2020. This is a picture of uh, Dwayne Johnson, who was the first um, uh, claimant um, and who has been a staunch supporter of uh, defending uh, all people's health from this chemical. He had been applying it for, for um, uh, decades um, and then got this, this cancer, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. But at the same time of the settlement, we see that um, uh, Deutsche Bank is saying, uh, this, this is good, it's insulating us, right? Um, so what we're seeing now is what's called regulatory whack-a-mole. Um, so you start banning uh, one uh, toxic chemical and another like dicamba shows up that's been waiting on the shelf uh, for um, institution. And so this isn't just about us, but this is about future generations as well. So uh, as our colleagues at UC Davis uh, found out, um, you know, pesticide drift happens. You uh, spray pesticides and the winds can carry it uh, miles away. Um, and a environmental health perspectives uh, uh, report showed that mother's uh, pesticide exposure from organophosphate drift during pregnancy um, of agricultural application were associated with a 60% uh, risk uh, for um, uh, aut autism. And just finally, to, to show that things are changing, um, we we are moving, especially in places like uh, San Francisco, the Bay Area, California, uh, away from this sort of more input, um, more hazard uh, towards um, transitioning to sustainable agricultural systems. And my colleagues will talk to you about that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yogi. Our next speaker is Dr. Brenda Eskenazi. Dr. Eskenazi is a professor of maternal and child health and epidemiology at UC Berkeley and the principal investigator and director of the NIEHS EPA Center for Environmental Research and Children's Health. She's going to talk uh, this evening about her current research on the impact of COVID-19 on farm workers, agricultural communities, and food production. But I also want to note that Dr. Eskenazi is, is also the principal investigator of the Chimaco study, which is a long-term longitudinal birth cohort study of pesticides and other environmental exposures among children in farm worker community in uh, California's Salinas Valley. They have followed these families for 20 years, measuring exposures to pesticides and other chemicals and assessing children's growth health and development every one to two years. 
Among the findings, for example, they've documented adverse impacts on neurodevelopment in children more highly exposed to certain pesticides during fetal development. And more than 600 children continue to participate in the study and will be followed until adulthood. So for those of you who are interested, uh, I suggest taking a look at the Chamaco study website, which is very, very informative. So Brenda, please go ahead. Thank you, Ted, and thank you all for listening tonight. Um, I think I probably should start out talking a little bit about Chamacos and our study. So back in 1998, we enrolled pregnant women that were primarily Latino, um, mostly from Mexico, farm workers and their families. And we have followed these the children. The children are now 21 years old. Um, during this time, we mostly studied organophosphate pesticides, although we studied many other pesticides too. And, and we found that, as Ted summarized, that um, in utero exposure, meaning during pregnancy exposure of the mother to mostly organophosphate pesticides were associated with shortened gestation of the child, poor neurodevelopment, including uh, abnormal reflexes, lowered IQ, uh, tension problems, um, autism trait. Um, and we also have found more recently um, effects on executive function in, in the uh, older children. But it wasn't just restricted to neurodevelopment. We also saw early life exposures were related to respiratory problems in the children. The children, as I said, are now 22 years old, 21 years, years old. We're still following them. We're looking at a uh, relationship with delinquency, risk-taking behavior um, in, in relationship to exposure to early, um, early life pesticides. But one thing we also found is that the pesticides used in the neighboring community were associated with the pesticide levels in the dust in their homes in the breast milk of the mothers and in the bodies of the infants. So we saw that there was direct connection between the use of pesticides in the community and what was in the mother and in the child. Since that time, we've studied other pesticides as well. And um, the uh, use of organophosphates has dramatically decreased in the 20 years, dramatically decreased. And as Yogi has just pointed out, we've seen a dramatic increase in the use of other pesticides such as glyphosate. Uh, but overall, the use of pesticides such as organophosphates, organochlorines, carbamates um, are on the decrease and increase of glyphosate and the new nicotinoids. But today, what I wanted to talk about is really another topic, and that is about COVID and farm workers. And the reason why I want to talk about COVID and fa these farm worker families is because COVID has pulled back the curtain of what is not working for farm workers in agricultural communities. Uh, as many of you probably have read in the newspapers, farm workers became infected at alarming rates. And the community clinics that I work in that serve farm workers and their families. Uh, during the surge back in December, we saw nearly a third of the farm workers that were being tested amongst thousands of farm workers that nearly a third were positive for COVID. And we asked, why? Why are so many farm workers becoming infected? And a number of things came to bear. We did a study of about 1,200 farm workers. It's the only study of of infection, of COVID infection in a farm working population that we know of worldwide thus far. And we saw that certain factors seem to contribute to uh, farm workers being infected. And some of those factors included the fact that they live in crowded housing. Some of those factors included the fact that many of them were speaking indigenous languages and may not have received the health messages. Other factors included the fact that they were traveling together in buses or in vehicles um, and infecting each other. Um, many of them went to work 
with infection, either because they were asymptomatic or because they felt well enough to go to work or because they feared that they would lose their jobs. So they were spreading infection. Um, during this time, we also saw an interdependence of the farm workforce and the industry that became so apparent. Not only did the pandemic make the farm workers sick, but the pandemic also affected the health of agriculture. The USDA reports that farm businesses have experienced huge disruptions in production due to declines in demands for commodities in certain market segments. A report commissioned by the California ag industry back in June reported that the decreased demand for California grown products around the world was predicted to have a direct economic impact on California agriculture estimated to be more than $6 billion this year. And at the very same time, there has been a grow greater demand on growers to step up and provide emergency housing for sick workers, replace lost wages, supply PPE. And we have seen in Monterey County that the growers have spearheaded most of the processes to protect the farm workers against COVID in our community. And we're very proud of that. Um, we also have seen that because of the impact of the pandemic on the industry, that it has affected the availability of farm working jobs. And this is already as we know, an economically disadvantaged community. In our study of 1,200 farm workers that we enrolled in the study of, of COVID, we found that 50% of them were earning less than $25,000 a year. So you also contribute to the fact that there is decrease in the need for agricultural materials because of decrease in um, demand for products. And you see less employment of the farm workers. So we see underemployment. Ironically, this translates into high rates of food insecurity amongst farm workers. Even before the pandemic, in our study of Chamacos, we saw very high rates of food insecurity in, in the people that were putting food on our table. During the pandemic, we see as high as 40% of the farm workers are food insecure, meaning they do not have enough food to feed their families. Um, not only are we seeing food insecurity and hunger, but as you can imagine, along with this, this, not, this work insecurity, the food insecurity, we're seeing clinical levels of depression and anxiety in the farm working population. So as I said earlier, COVID has pulled back the curtain of what is problematic in the agricultural industry. And I asked, as I said earlier, why are farm workers getting sick? And I said that they live in very crowded conditions. We are seeing that something like 40% of our population is living at what is considered to be by the uh, Housing and Urban Development in crowded conditions. The lack of low cost housing stock, especially so close, close to Silicon Valley, has co contributed to this extremely crowded living conditions. One estimate is that in other studies that 70% of farm workers live in severely overcrowded housing. And we know that workers who arrive under, uh, for example, the H-2A visa are usually housed in group occupancy, such as an employer-owned uh, dormitories, this has also served to potentially increase COVID infection. So not only are they working together, commuting together, living in crowded housing, but as I said earlier, they're going to work sick. And we ask people, why are they going to work sick? Many fear that they will lose their job, Many fear that they're going to be deported. 
Many are afraid that they're going to lose other benefits. They're afraid that if they don't go to work, they're gonna be unable to feed their families. So they'd rather go to work with a fever than to stay at home and not be able to support their families. Many are unaware of the programs, both the state and the federal funds that have been provided to uh, replacement income. They are scared to ask. Something like 50 to 60% of farm workers in California are thought to be undocumented. So much to much extent, what has happened is grounded in fear and also low health literacy. One population that we're particularly concerned about are the population that speak indigenous languages. We found that they were particularly hard hit by COVID and their understanding of COVID was probably lower because the health messages were not coming out in their languages. And many of these languages are not written languages. So COVID-19 has laid bare all of the underlying problems that have historically plagued farm work in the United States and put it into relief. The lack of affordable quality housing, the irrational immigration policies, the hierarchies in the farming sector. We have seen, for example, people that are, um, are at, former farm workers who are now the supervisors of the farm workers are the ones that aren't giving the information to the farm workers on how to protect themselves, even though the growers themselves have provided a, a tremendous amount of education, at least in Monterey County. Um, we especially worry about the lack of trust between farm workers um, and their advocates, the farm worker advocates and the growers, and how the litigious environment that we live in between the farm workers and their advocates versus the growers has become the only means to create change, but it also builds upon a tremendous amount of distrust. Um, we have one major success story that I just like to close with. And that is, uh, you probably have seen in the news as of yesterday, that farm workers are being vaccinated in large numbers, that we were able to advocate, many of us advocated that farm workers would be considered in one of the top tiers to receive vaccinations. And because of, in my county, Monterey County, the um, pairing up between the growers and the federally qualified um, health providers, we are now providing vaccination in the fields, in the communities to farm workers by trusted entities. And so this is a success story. We're hoping that this spring we do not see the large increases in COVID one more time with the next surge. Thank you. And I look forward to hearing questions. Thank you very much, Brenda. We're going to move on now to our next panel speaker, uh, and this is really going to be a bit of a shift of gears. Uh, we're going to begin to look at some of the solutions to some of the problems that we have uh, briefly described. Lucia Sayer is the Director of Regional Innovation and Community Resilience for the Healthy Food and Healthcare Program of Healthcare Without Harm. With over 25 years of experience in food systems and community organizing, Lucia provides leadership, vision, and direction for healthy food and health care's regional programs in the Western US to engage the healthcare sector in cultivating best practices for supporting, advocating for, and investing in healthy and sustainable food systems. Lucia is responsible for designing innovative models that engage healthcare institutions in their role as anchor institutions to work with their local communities in building community health, wealth, and climate resilience. So Lucia, please go ahead. Thank you, Ted. Um, and I'm very happy to be here and be part of this panel and look forward to the discussion afterwards. So I'm gonna just give a very brief um, background introduction to Healthcare Without Harm. 
and the healthy food in healthcare program of Healthcare Without Harm. And then I'm going to switch over to describe a new model that we have been working on called Anchors in Resilient Communities for about the past five years. So just briefly, um, Healthcare Without Harm is 25 years old this year. Uh, the organization's mission is to transform healthcare worldwide so that it reduces its environmental footprint, becomes a community anchor for sustainability and a leader in the global movement for environmental health and justice. Healthcare Without Harm has program staff and partners across the globe working on climate change, safer chemicals and healthier food systems, as well as a membership arm called Practice Green Health with over 1,700 member hospitals across the US. The Healthy Food and Healthcare Program of Healthcare Without Harm got its start here in the Bay Area back in about 2005 uh, in partnership with the San Francisco Bay Area Chapter of Physicians for Social Responsibility and Kaiser Permanente when we hosted the first Food Med Conference in Oakland. Since then, the Healthy Food and Healthcare Program has grown to a national network of over 1,000 hospitals and over 4,000 health professionals that are engaged in the work. The Healthy Food and Healthcare Program is grounded in the principle, in the concept of environmental nutrition, that healthy food cannot be defined by nutritional quality alone but is the end result of a food system that conserves and renews natural resources, advances social justice and animal welfare, and builds community health and wealth. And we can thank Ted Shetler for helping Healthcare Without Harm design and, and write our sort of concept paper on environmental nutrition several years ago. So our work is really about leveraging the purchasing power, the expertise and investment potential of the healthcare sector to build a healthier sustainable food system. So using that institutional market as a strategy. Um, with the passage of the Affordable Care Act in 2010 and a shift towards a focus on population health and the social determinants of health, Healthcare Without Harm began to expand its work from being basically within the operations of the four walls of the hospital to the surrounding community and helped to define the role of healthcare as anchor institutions. So now I'm gonna switch over into a model that Healthcare Without Harm and Healthy Food and Healthcare has been working on to develop the past five years or so in the East Bay. Um, about five years ago, Healthcare Without Harm and our partners at Emerald Cities Collaborative basically asked the question, you know, how can we strategize together? So how can we bring anchor institutions together with community stakeholders to really leverage the procurement and investment power of anchor institutions to address the social determinants of health? So ARC, uh, the Anchors and Resilient Communities or ARC table was not started around food systems um, as a priority. It was really started and developed as a way for anchors and community to work together around social determinants of health. Fast forward five years, ARC today is a multi-stakeholder table of representatives from key anchor institutions in the healthcare and education sectors nonprofit organizations, community leaders, and cities and counties in the Bay Area. ARC's mission is to focus on expanding community wealth and ownership, improving health outcomes, and strengthening the capacity of communities of color and low and moderate income residents to be resilient in the face of climate and economic disruption. Some of the key partners that, are, that sit at the ARC table are the California Endowment, Kaiser Permanente, University of California, San Francisco, UC Berkeley, Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland, as well as Rubicon programs, Planting Justice, Mandela Partners, um, and Dig Deep Farms uh, with Alameda County. And you're gonna hear from Hillary Bass, who is um, 
one of the leaders of that program in just a minute. Next slide. So as this table was developing as a, as a strategy for opening equitable communication, lines of communication between anchors and community, um, one of the first steps that the ARC stakeholders undertook was to contract with the Democracy Collaborative over a period of about 18 months, conducting over 200 interviews of both anchor and community partners, assessing both the anchor's collective needs for products, goods, and services, and the existing capacities and opportunities within the communities of the East Bay that could be lifted up and supported. And there were two major findings to that assessment. Um, the first was that the collective spend of anchor institutions in the East Bay alone on products, goods, and services was approximately six to eight billion dollars a year with a B, <laughs> billion dollars a year and just in with the East Bay anchors alone. So a lot of money that anchor institutions are spending on their needs and their products and goods, um, hopefully with some of that being able to be tailored and targeted to local community. Three areas of potential project growth were also identified in the study um, th that had a lot of potential because of the environmental justice history, the food justice history, the innovation within the East Bay communities over many, many years. And those three areas were local regional food systems, clean energy investment, and green business enterprises. Next slide. So the first project that ARC took on is called the Regional Food System Initiative. And it's really about developing an equitable and resilient food economy that impacts community health outcomes and localizes the food economy to generate community wealth. So this initiative was chosen as a first project for a few strategic reasons. Kaiser Permanente had just announced a commitment to 100% local and sustainable food sourcing system-wide by 2025. This was about two and a half years ago. Kaiser's long-term vendor contract for their patient meals in Northern California was coming up for bid and the vendor was in need of expanded capacity here in the Bay Area to meet the demands of that contract. So we saw an opportunity to locate a food system economic driver in the East Bay, which is all about uh, meal production and meal distribution to Kaiser Permanente's um, 22 Northern California facilities. And the third was that ARC, the other anchor institutions, including Kaiser, had all committed to purchasing more local and sustainably produced food and are in the process of doing so. Um, but we really wanted to um, ramp that, those commitments up. Um, the goals of the initiative are basically threefold, to aggregate institutional demand for local and sustainable food products, to increase community-owned food businesses and manufacturing opportunities, and to increase opportunities for local Black, Indigenous, and people of color producers who have been historically excluded from institutional markets. And we believe that healthcare institutions as anchors can play a really critical role here through community benefits investments, program related investments, and aggregated and long term shifts in their procurement. So, healthcare can really bring this concept to life. Um, and we have a shining example here in the East Bay, actually in Union City, California. Um, and just to describe how, for example, Kaiser Permanente as a healthcare anchor has been involved with ARC um, and helped bring this to life. Kaiser Permanente has supported ARC since its inception through charitable contributions, community benefit dollars, and active participation on the anchor, on sorry, on the ARC steering committee. 
Kaiser Permanente's support has enabled its vendor food service partners to work with other partners and develop a new food production facility in Union City, California, which I'm very happy to report just opened about six weeks ago, um, which was kind of amazing in the year of COVID and everything else that was going on that the facility was completely renovated and, and is now open and delivering meals to Kaiser facilities in Northern California. Um, at full capacity, this center will have, will be able to produce about 50,000 meals per day for distribution in Northern California and create up to 150 living wage union jobs in the community, working with anchors and resilient communities to support with our workforce partners. And Kaiser Permanente also provided a $2 million loan guarantee grant to assist with the financing of the food production uh, facility. So you'll see on this slide, it has the new facility not only has environmental and climate benefits, but it also has a list of community benefits attached to it as well. And the community, this is an important piece, I think, of ARC's work as a multi stakeholder table with a vendor of a healthcare institution. So we worked with um, the development team and food service partners, the lenders that made the financing possible for the new center to draw up a community benefit agreement. So the community benefit agreement, which is tied to the loans for the building of the facility, include community impact goals in four areas, a commitment to sourcing of local and sustainable products, a reduction in carbon emission, uh, workforce prioritizing local residents with barriers to employment, and employee and community ownership. So ARC's role in uh, supporting the success of this new food production center is really to act as a facilitator between food service partners and our regional food system working group, which includes community organizations such as Dig Deep, Mandela Partners, um, planting Justice and Kitchen Table Advisors. We are assisting and supporting with hopefully building more forward contracting in um, value added product development, bringing on more institutional contracts, increasing small scale producers of color, increasing their opportunities for institutional contracts. Um, and supporting capacity building efforts for access into institutional markets. ARC's role is sort of twofold. We're supporting with the supply chain development, basically a value chain development around the new center that can hopefully build community wealth, increase the number of community owned businesses. And we're also helping uh, with workforce strategy. So ARC, um, is supporting the hiring and retention of new employees for the Union City Center, hiring at the Food Production Center for living wage union jobs, prioritizing local, justice involved, formerly long-term unemployed people of color. And thirdly, um, helping to build pathways to community ownership. So one of the conversations, for example, that we just started last week actually with the new center now being open is what are some of the opportunities and options for increased community ownership of the center itself? Um, how, can we, how can we raise an investment that the community can make into this very integral part of their local food economy? Um, and so very importantly, um, you know, we have the community benefit agreement that is tied to the loan, uh, the loan and the financing for the center. We will also, over the next two to five years, be measuring regional food system uh, impact. So we have designed a set of indicators, for example, um, number of living wage jobs that are created and held, 
uh, percentage of community ownership into participating business. Sourcing examples include, you know, the dollar amounts actually paid to small farms within what we call the hyper local or 50 miles from the center. You know, how can we increase institutional contracting, contracting for those hyper, for those farmers in the hyper local area right around the center. And I think I will stop there. And this is some lovely artwork from our new website that just went up a few months back called uh, Anchors in Resilient Communities org, or that's the URL. So thank you. Ted, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Lucia, for a wonderful presentation uh, and uh, some up uplifting ideas. And mm -hmm. uh, to continue in that theme, I'm pleased to introduce Hillary Bass, who is executive director of the Alameda County Deputy Sheriff's Activities League, a nonprofit founded in partnership with the Alameda County Sheriff's Office that supports a range of food system initiatives. Hillary will talk about the vision of Dig Deep mentioned by uh, Lucia uh, and a progressive approach to public safety and community health through the strength of a local food economy. So uh, Hillary, please go ahead. Thanks for having me. I'm honored to be here today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I actually work for the Alameda County Sheriff's Office and um, as part of our um, crime prevention unit that we've been building over the last 16 years, we established a nonprofit called the Deputy Sheriff's Activities League or DSAL that I oversee. And um, we've sort of leveraged the nonprofit to be, um, I'd say an innovative, an innovative arm of the agency. Um, as people across this nation are demanding for change and police reform, we have been at this from the inside out for the last 16 years. And uh, I will attest that it is hard and um, I think that what's interesting is that there's a very real parallel between attempting to change policing and seeing the intersection in um, other systems that need to be changed in order to actually address what would be better referred to as public safety. Um, if we actually want public safety, we find ourselves looking at the systems that impact public health and economic development and um, healthcare. Uh, I mean, well, all, all of the thing, all of the systems basically have some relationship to um, one's ability to live a thriving, healthy and safe life. Um, so about 10 years ago, actually about 11 years ago, my boss and I, my boss is a captain. I'm a civilian, um, not to be trusted with uh, weapons, um, but, we read the book by Van Jones, The Green Collar Economy. And I, if you haven't read it already, uh, you should. He was an early, uh, an early ad adopter of the idea of a Green New Deal, which I have hope for still. And he more or less articulated that America should invest in um, a green economy where jobs are established to benefit the earth and the environment and specifically train and hire people into that economy who have been more or less excluded from the traditional gray economy. Uh, people who have um, criminal backgrounds, young people, um, et cetera. So we uh, fell in love with Van Jones and that book and we decided to start a farm. Uh, we call it Dig Deep Farms. And um, going into this, we knew nothing about farming. We just thought it was a good idea. Um, I will spare you the gory details of how hard it is to start a farm when you know nothing about farming and the uh, quantity of plants and trees that didn't survive our lack of knowledge. But um, 10 years later, we've learned a lot and we have established a set of urban farms in, the, uh, in Alameda County that uh, employ about 10 people from our community who have become experts in permaculture design and regenerative ag. And um, you've heard so many different things about the value of these practices in having environmental impacts and uh, human impacts. So all of our produce that we grow is actually uh, sort of at the standards of, of what we're calling medicine. And it is being distributed to clinics throughout our county whose um, doctors are 
transforming their practices to screen and um, prescribe their patients who have diet related conditions uh, to consume our produce every week for 16 weeks. And we're seeing significant health uh, outcomes as a result, which is probably no surprise because of everything we've already heard. Um, but adapting these systems is the, the, big, the big nugget here. Um, so uh, to that end, we wanted to create more jobs in the food economy. So we built a food hub and um, I'm gonna get through these slides, but um, we wanted to create more jobs to build out the, the sort of full circle of the system as we began to understand it more, that it's not just production, um, it's what you do with it after that. And where does it go? And who eats it? And what does that impact? Um, and what about the waste? So all of that has resulted in what is now what we're calling the circular food economy in Alameda County. And we're working very closely as the Sheriff's Office with County Supervisor Wilma Chan and All In. Um, if you're unfamiliar, All In is a department within the county that is, has been set up by Supervisor Chan to end poverty. And as I was stating earlier, um, we in, in the Sheriff's Office cannot extract ourselves from the need to address poverty as part of a public safety imperative. Um, so we have built this foundational infrastructure that is now leading to what we can see as a full circle food system that can be scaled, which I'm going to lay out here briefly. Um, so the first set, the first element of that is, is production, produ uh, produce. Uh, so far that is Dig Deep Farms, as I said, and um, within Dig, Dig Deep Farms, we have established a reentry farmer internship model where people coming through periods of incarceration can come out and get paid as interns for six weeks, um, sometimes more, to earn their uh, cert certificate in permaculture design and urban farming. And this can allow them to either move on to other educational experiences or other job opportunities or be part of the pool for employment opportunities as we're able to hire. Um, and we partner deeply closely with the probation department to execute these uh, paid internships. Um, we're also establishing a set of standards, uh, regenerative ag standards. Um, we understand and are very familiar with the organic certification standards and those are good. And we are uh, actually halfway through the process uh, ourselves of being certified organic because that seems valuable um, on the face of it. But regenerative ag, um, from my layman's uh, perspective and my uh, learning of it, as I'm not the farmer, is actually a higher standard. And the sustainability that it um, offers to the earth and to the, and, and the, what it produces in terms of nutrient density to the medicine that we're growing for, for patients is, um, needs to become the, the bar. So we're establishing those standards and we're working toward built, bringing in other small farmers to learn about that those practices and become part of a collective that can produce more food for more patients. Some of the progress that we've made to scale this is that we've recently been able to convince our board of supervisors to pass a good food purchasing policy. And this is really important in terms of the systems that um, you heard Lucia just talking about in terms of institutional procurement and the role of that, that that plays in supporting the local food economy. So um, Alameda County is a major institutional food procurer. And um, we were able to write up a good food purchasing policy that they passed that embeds uh, values around purchasing from local um, people in our community, as well as prioritizing those who are um, pr producers of color and paying living wages. And this is something that I have learned a lot about in terms of um, where the barriers to success happen in terms of our food system is really when you follow those dollars. And when, the, when the, those who get selected for these contracts are always the lowest bidder, um, the question really should be, what are we losing when we, um, when we go with those lowest bidders? So by passing this good food purchasing policy, our farmers and our local producers have a shot at actually benefiting from the county dollars uh, around procurement. We're working with other small farmers to establish smaller farms and urban farms, figure out where the blighted land is and turn those into production spaces for the aggregate of food for medicine, um, which will lead to a collective of folks who can benefit financially. The next uh, bucket is the aggregation area 
Yeah, which is where the food hub comes in. We originally built this food hub and I will say it took nine years to get it done because nobody wanted to give us money to do it because who wants to give a sheriff's office money to build a kitchen? Um, so it took a while, but we opened minutes before COVID hit and we thought originally in the business plan that we would be supporting new businesses as they wanted to get started in the food economy. But what happened with COVID is that we needed to support existing businesses who were gonna go under. So um, not only do we aggregate our, our produce at this location, um, we bring Dig Deep Farms produce, but um, as we procure from other small farmers to um, fulfill the demand for the food as medicine, um, and hopefully one day other institutional contracts as Lucia laid out, maybe Kaiser will wanna buy a huge swath of our kale. Um, we can aggregate it at the food hub, wash it, chop it, whatever we need to do, get ready for redistribution um, and support our food, small food businesses um, as they either incubate to become an official you know, larger business or um, maintain their revenue um, while they potentially, uh, as we've seen recently, lose their brick and mortar locations. Also, food recovery. Um, there is a law that was passed, uh, SB 1383. It's a climate action um, law that actually includes food recovery as within it, where every municipality in California is um, required to redirect 20% of its food that would have been otherwise wasted into human consumption. So you can't give it to your animals, you can't put it into the compost, you have to feed the people. So we, um, thanks to Supervisor Chan's leadership, we've been able to get originally two uh, refrigerated vans to launch this uh, food recovery initiative and work with the probation department to get some drivers to get paid to be, to drive and pick up food that was otherwise gonna be wasted and then bring it uh, to low-income housing complexes. Um, subsequently, this has resulted in an increased investment where we now have 14 refrigerated vans and uh, we're still trying to onboard more drivers through the probation department um, to uh, drive the vans and pick up. Uh, we've been turning down food uh, because we don't have, we have just have trying to grow the capacity. Um, but this is the role of the food hub in the equation here is to um, bring food back into the hub <clears throat> for some level of storing or processing or you know, sorting that for get ready for going back out to low income housing uh, complexes. We are breaking at the seams already, and uh, this is requiring us to look at opportunities for expanding into more food hubs. Um, we're looking at talking to other municipalities in Alameda County to see what kind of commercial kitchen spaces they have available so we can um, add them to the mix and, and increase our storage capacity for bringing in more food, um, supporting more of the food entrepreneurs and the aggregation for distribution. Um, and also as, Lu as, as Lucia laid out with inst institutional procurement um, and the, the opportunity that the Union City um, Food Hub demonstrates is that you really need this infrastructure to be able to facilitate uh, mass uh, you know, aggregation for distribution. So Dig Deep Farms can't grow enough um, tomatoes for Kaiser, but we can work with our partners and each of us can grow all the tomatoes we can grow, bring them to a food hub and then get them to Kaiser. And that will fulfill some level of their procurement that would be um, fulfilling their goals and uh, and supporting our local food economy uh, financially. So the food entrepreneurs processing is the next phase. Food entrepreneurs is a critical piece here. Um, and what, right now we have over, I think we have 32 small food businesses who are utilizing our current food hub. The place is, is literally breaking at the seams. It's a 24 seven operation and there is absolutely a need for more food hubs to support our small food economy, small food business uh, economy. Um, since COVID, since uh, first shelter in place, we've been able to support these vendors in producing 76,484 meals um, that have been, uh, they've been paid $15 per meal um, through a range of funding streams. And those meals have then been distributed to vulnerable folks throughout the county. Um, 
and there's a lot more to do and there's a lot more in terms of supporting kind of whatever the new world order will look like for our food businesses. Um, I personally went out to eat for the first time uh, at a restaurant over the weekend and I can't remember the last time I did that and I'm not sure I even wanna do it again. But I think that food delivery um, and supporting our food businesses in our food hubs um, is going to be probably required to continue to support them over time, um, even post COVID. So as I said, uh, we currently have a contract with social services in Alameda County to continue paying, and this is coming through the CARES Act funding. Uh, we anticipate more coming through the Biden administration. To, uh, and in fact, this week alone, we have 10,000 meals going out just this week, paid for um, by, social, by the uh, CARES Act and going to our small food businesses, funneling through our food hub and getting distributed to our vulnerable population. AB 3118 is a policy that we're pushing through um, uh, with the help of Supervisor Chan and Bonta's office, Assemblymember Bonta, uh, which will support med, uh, advocate for medically supportive meals and food as medicine to be a covered benefit in Medi-Cal. This would be a game changer in terms of revenue streams to support our local food economy. Um, if Medi-Cal will in fact continue, will pay for produce, grown by our local producers like Dig Deep Farms, as well as medically supportive meals produced by our local food vendors out of our food hubs, um, then uh, in a way that's nutritionally dense and locally sourced, um, we're winning on all fronts, on the healthcare front, on the economic development front, and to us, the public safety front. The other uh, um, revenue stream that we're trying to um, work out is the SNAP benefits or CalFresh here in California. Um, we're able to facilitate SNAP benefits already uh, to pay for, low, for our meals coming out of our food hub by our vendors and our produce. The problem is that the USDA calculates SNAP benefits equally across the country. So our folks here in the Bay Area are getting the same amount of SNAP benefits as those in Utah. And they can only make those last for you know, a certain number of days when those maybe in Utah can go much longer. So we have to there's these are other systems that I'm learning about that are impacting our food economy and what ultimately um, allows people to um, have a living wage and pay their rent and keep their family afloat and eat well um, or not. So um, it's sort of a work in progress there. Um, we're training our, our food vendors this week on improving their nutritional standards in their meal production so that they can be prepared uh, when the policy comes to fruition uh, for meals to be a covered benefit under Medi-Cal. Next up is distribute. This is my favorite section because it has the potential to employ the most people. And that's kind of our, one of my personal uh, goals is to create as many jobs as humanly possible. Um, so far, we have been able to, through the vans that we've been able to procure through the county, the probation, through the probation department and the board of supervisors, um, We've been able to hire uh, 15 drivers who are on probation and pay them 20 bucks an hour. We've had 5,934 hours of uh, internships. Um, those are people who are uh, young adults, women who are victims of violence at the, the District Attorney's Family Justice Center, as well as people on probation to, to come through some level of this food economy, but especially the van, the driving role. And um, we've developed a dispatch system so that we can bring uh, even the COVID positive folks through public health uh, who need food delivered twice a week for two weeks to stay at home, uh, that we get them dispatched out to our drivers for getting the food out of the food hub and bringing it to their homes. And also with food as medicine, that used to be an in-clinic model. And now all of the medicine is bagged up at the food hub and distributed to 600 patients' doorsteps every week. Um, by our drivers. And that's growing because we continue to add clinics throughout the county. Additionally, um, there have been 125,368 bags of groceries delivered uh, to people who are vulnerable throughout our county since the first shelter in place. And I believe I already told you 76,000 meals. Um, so those are important stats. This can continue to grow because we're looking to ask the county for additional funding to um, add more vans and more drivers um, so that we can support our partners who are 
um, like Meals on Wheels, for example, who has 6,000 senior citizens that they deliver to monthly, yet their driver force is are all volunteers. And within COVID, um, that's been a challenge and we wanna be able to fill those gaps. And with food recovery, which I'm about to speak about next is, and last, um, we're turning down opportunities to pick up and deliver food only because of our capacity. So we need more vans, we need more drivers, and this is a huge economic model for the county and supporting our reentry population who um, there's a huge return on investment by doing this model. Um, to that end, we're also working on a mobile app so we can kind of compete with Grubhub, um, but sort of the public option version. Um, we don't want to actually harm, financially harm our small businesses. We want to help them by not having any charges. Um, so by having the county invest in the drivers and the vans and that infrastructure, then we can support our small food businesses and not have all of those surcharges to get food to the people who need it the most. Um, and they can use their CalFresh benefits and, and whatnot. Um, so public option of Grubhub. And um, we're trying to expand food as medicine throughout the county, as I mentioned. Yeah, lots to do there. Last but not least is food recovery. Um, so as, as I mentioned, it's a, bill, it's a law, SB 1383. And to date, since the beginning of uh, March, we have recovered 1.3 million pounds of food. And that is with limited infrastructure. So um, we are anticipating being able to recover um, hundreds of thousands of pounds of food every uh, month if we can have more uh, of the infrastructure that we need. And um, this serves thousands of people in the affordable housing complexes. Uh, we partner with um, housing developers like Mercy Housing, uh, RCD, Eden Housing, um, and Ibaltsi and Saha. And they have housing developments all around the county where uh, senior citizens and other families who are low income are residing and being able to access food that we recover from even right now, especially the school districts. Uh, where we get pallets of meals that didn't get distributed to students or other producers and maybe one day that will be also Kaiser or other uh, large institutions who have waste at the end of the day but don't want to throw it away we can get pick up that food and bring it right away to our vulnerable uh, community and save them money so they don't have to buy food um, and keep them safe and healthy um, this also will support composting because things that can't get redistributed we can put right back into the, where we started here in the circle, which is production and the farms, which makes it truly a full circle. Um, our goals, as I said, is to add capacity so we can increase food recovery throughout all the municipalities in Alameda County. Our hope is that we can go to the cities of San Leandro, the cities of Hayward, um, and say, hey, we can offer you compliance with the law if you maybe throw in a little uh, financial resource to offset the costs of our job creation that we're doing here. Um, or something to that effect, and, um, and also further support climate impacts as we do that, um, and increase our compost collection to support all of the local production and the farms. All said and done, we think that this, these are the outcomes that can be accomplished for the county by doing this for full circle investment. Um, we think we can create 360 or more reentry jobs. We can save over 6,000 tons a year of carbon emissions from the, from the sky. Um, we can incubate 52 or more food businesses, and we can recover millions of pounds of food a year and redistribute that. And we can improve health impacts for patient over 6,000 patients throughout the county um, and reduce their visits to the emergency department as a result. And we can reduce food insecurity. And um, as I said in the very beginning, all of this will dramatically impact uh, public safety outcomes, which um, if anybody who's interested in police reform was paying attention, this would be a great way to invest in um, a new model of achieving public safety. Thank you so much, Hillary. Um, that was a great presentation. And now I believe we're going to turn it over to any um, comments. We just got one wonderful comment that um, was amazing. So great. Uh, it looks like there is a question also. Okay, Brenda, would you like to begin? It sounds like you'd like to add something and I'll check out what's uh, going on in the chat. Oh, I'm really excited by the presentations, the other presentations. And um, 
Hillary, I wanted to, I put something in the chat, but I wanted to expand upon it. Um, years ago, uh, Preston Maring and I uh, were thinking about what we really needed to do was a clinical trial of um, organic, uh, sustainably grown food and distribute it to WIC. Um, because of course we've, we've learned, those of us in maternal and child health that it's a prime time to um, educate uh, families about they're motivated during pregnancy, having young children, motivated to change diet and also to reduce food insecurity when it's most important. Um, I'm wondering if this is on your radar of something that could be done. I mean, you're doing so much already. I hate to add one more thing, um, but it seems to me a prime population that should be um, benefiting from what you're doing. I totally agree with you. And just for the record, I emailed Preston, Preston Maring like 12 <laughs> years ago and he didn't get back to me. So if you could let him know. I'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say that, you know, I think that what I'm really learning is that, um, you know, if we, I haven't investigated WIC, I've started to investigate SNAP benefits. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that um, the only way to make any of those, any of that sort of work is to make sure that the calculations and the algorithms that are being, so whoever is in charge of, of, of making them uh, for how many benefits people get can really support paying for the production of the good food for the producers. Like that, that line, that dollar line, because you know, anything's possible, but I can't, I, even at this point, like even though we figured out how to facilitate EBT payments for our meal vendors and our, and our farm uh, farmers, I just can't imagine that uh, it, you know, somebody in the Bay Area could rationalize spending $15 on one meal out of their CalFresh benefits when they can't barely make it last 10 days for the, out of the month. So that's some of the systemic stuff that I feel like is really a barrier to making these things work well. And I think you're right on in terms of who should be having the food and who should be um, benefiting from what we know. I mean, this to a certain extent, all of this is so back to the future. It's so common sense, like eat well, exercise and, you know, pay rent, you'll be fine. Um, but we're having trouble, you know, we've built our food system on, on the back of slavery in America and we haven't really figured our way out of that. And I work for the sheriff's office and policing has a role to play in upholding those policies and we have to unwind that. And there's, so yes, and <laughs> how do we get in charge of who, whoever's in charge of WIC? <laughs> I just want to add on to that, Hillary, with, you know, the work around institutional pricing structures is, again, something that is so heavily embedded in a, in a unhealthy system. You know, institutions don't pay a lot of money for food. And when you try to think about supporting local farmers with a living wage so that their children can have health insurance, you know, they can live a healthy life, um, the cost differential is, is huge. Sometimes it's 30 to 40% um, that institutions are paying less than what would provide even living wage for farmers, producers, and processors. So we're not, we're definitely not, we're just getting into the woods pretty thickly about how do we, how do we solve for those issues? Lucia, there was a question for you in the chat. Um, this was from Bob Gould. We've been trying to integrate um, healthcare without harm, PGH sustainability principles beyond UCSS systems into climate sustainability curriculum components for health professional students. Given Kaiser's uptake on these programs, do you know if any of the stuff informing curriculum of Kaiser's new medical school? Does that make sense? Yeah, um, and, and I don't know. I, 
I don't know of any of that kind of information being integrated into medical school curricula. Not sure, but we can certainly do some asking around mm -hmm. in Kaiser. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I think we also had a, a comment or question from Nadia. Nadia, would you go ahead? I see your hand raised. I was wondering specifically of um, Dr. Um, Hale Henlin and Dr. Eskenazi, like what are the leverage points for interrupting this toxic industrial food system? And aside from litigation, um, you know, could you talk more about how exposed workers and farm workers themselves are organizing and how perhaps industry may be undercutting um, their ability to unionize and to get um, worker safety standards um, in, their, in their workplaces? Um, so I was really curious about that. And then because I felt the panel took this transition also to thinking about um, kind of programmatic um, like programs and solutions that are offering change, I did want to comment. Um, I kind of came to another question, but I'll pose it as a comment. You know, worrying, I think, as you said, um, with all due respect to the amazing variety of programs that you all are um, doing, that um, sometimes environmental justice initiatives can greenwash um, some of the violence embedded either in institutions like policing or often in healthcare. Um, so how do you reconcile that? Um, and also, you know, how do we think about how environmental justice initiatives are situated and funded, whether they come from nonprofits or whether they come from unions and what that has looked like historically? Uh, it's a big question for the last couple of minutes, but I would love um, some perspective. Very briefly before I let uh, Professor Eskenazi uh, give a more detailed uh, answer, um, we are subsidizing currently a lot of the uh, chemical inputs in our industrial food system. Uh, you know, if we had a carbon tax, uh, we would have a much lower uh, input um, because these things are expensive and they're uh, carbon expensive and all of the externalities that are um, not taken into account in the price of pesticides um, get, uh, you know, uh, exposed uh, in our environment and to human health. So I think that we need to really look at the fundamental drivers um, of why this uh, idea of cheap food um, with these expensive pesticides uh, works um, in the first place. Um, thank you. If I could add to that, you give me a perfect entree. Um, having worked in agriculture, working with farm workers for about 25 years, what I've learned is that the growers don't really want to be using pesticides because it's very costly. Um, the, and the people that are benefiting the most are the chemical companies, less the growers. There are, of course, certain reasons why they, they turn to synthetic chemicals, but some of the organic uh, just because you're using organics doesn't mean you're not using chemicals. Some of those chemicals might also, for example, sulfur is used in organics. It's a respiratory irritant. So we need to walk away from chemicals as much as possible. And growers want to do that because of the cost. Um, if there were alternatives. So if we learned more about how to control some of the pests that are occurring in the farms. Um, I think that, you know, Yogi, you, allude, you mentioned this, that we have really cheap food in the United States. The cost of our food is very low and we're used to that. And it's part of what's contributing to the fact that farm workers have such low wages. And so there is a whole systems change that we need to think about and not necessarily point fingers that it's the grower's fault, there's this person's fault or that person's fault, but rally, rather it's a system problem. And it's also us, the consumers, who aren't willing to pay more for our food. I'd like to go ahead and conclude tonight's webinar and um, to thank our panelists and our moderator for your presentations and um, this discussion. Um, it's been really um, inspiring. And, um, and I also want to thank all of you who have joined us tonight for participating. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.